It is Wednesday afternoon, August 28th. We did not have class on the 21st for any looking for that on the video. We're picking up from August 14th, where we ended in Bereshit, uh, Genesis chapter 49. We ended close to verse 26, but just as a quick review to bring us back on the same page and start with all of the prophecy to Yosef. Remember, Jacob, Jacob is giving his last blessing over his 12 sons. It actually is a prophetic vision that God has given him. It is long. It, it had some relevance at the time, but some of what he said to some of the sons is yet to be fulfilled and won't be until Messiah returns and sets up his kingdom on earth. Yosef received one of the greater blessings um, because of his position that he had been brought into. We know even through his sons that he receives the double portion like the firstborn. He was not firstborn. Reuben and Shimon Simon were the firstborn and second in line, but they were knocked out because of behavior. And we see Judah brought up uh, into position to be the line Messiah comes through. But Yosef was Rachel, Rachel's firstborn. And it, it's not because of that, because God wouldn't allow it to be the firstborn of a favored wife. It was to be firstborn, period. But it does seem, because we know that Yaakov did not choose Leah. That was, um, he, he was tricked into that marriage. So it, it's, it's in a way as if God was honoring that Rachel was who would have been first wife and their son that would have been firstborn then would have been Yosef. But I think it's highly dependent on his character who he's representing, a picture of Messiah that we saw beautifully as we went through his study in 80 some odd points, that this that's reason also why in that firstborn position, because Messiah is also firstborn in rank, in position. He was not born in his godhood, he was only born in his humanity. But we'll talk more about that, that rank and that position as we go on, probably even in class today. So coming now down into the prophecy that, that was given to Yosef, so positive that he was a fruitful bow or uh, a fruitful tree, speaking of him as a youth in his father's house, that, that he was an object of beauty and that he had tender care. He was well-pleasing to his father, again, a, a comparison to our Messiah. His son is interesting. Ephraim means fruitful, and so that, that name carries on. And it, we can look at Joseph and say he was well watered. He was provided for in his deep relationship with God. That's how he lived as God's servant. And he also lived for God as God's child. We see all of that in his life. He was by the, the spring well that shows that it would be um, guaranteeing the, the fertility, everything that was needed for a, a prosperous life for a bounty to come from that, so much so the branches hung over the wall. In that we saw the double inheritance that I already mentioned just a moment ago. Um, but then we saw also in the, the next verse, getting down, yes, into 23, that the archers provoked him, that he was se severely grieved, he was harassed, there was enmity against him. This was by his brothers, this was by Potiphar's wife, he even was, quote, ill-treated by Potiphar, not that Potiphar wanted to, but he had to have him thrown into the dungeon. Of course, we know that was all part of God's perfect plan. But he went through that period in his life, yet in it, in verse 24, he remained strong and steady. His bow was strong. He was agile. He had the hands of Almighty God on him. We saw the, the mighty name of God that was given there. And uh, the, the double play there is he gave um, to Yosef what was his own. And that from there, from the God of Jacob, not from Yosef, but from the God of Jacob, the shepherd, the rock of Israel, both the great shepherd of Israel and the rock of Israel, both would, would come and have his hand. I have to use it singular because those are pictures of Messiah who will protect and has protected Israel. And that this was being promised, that he would be the rock, he would be the, the shepherd, nurturer, nurturer, all that was in there. We looked extensively at the meaning of the rock in scripture, the meaning of the shepherd. When I say we looked extensively, we did for the verse in, in Bereshit, but we could go through studies, uh, lengthy studies, taking it all the way through scripture. And I encourage you, if you are a student of the word and you love to look through all of scripture, take the rock and look at it from Bereshit to Revelation 
take the shepherd in that same way, you won't be disappointed. I've done many lessons on different verses within that, and I haven't even scratched the surface. I'll just put it that way. In verse 25, we see what's being prophetically promised to him, the blessings of heaven. That's the abundant rain and the dew. That's spiritual blessings that would be his. Then we see earthly blessings of the deep, the good soil, that here on earth he would be prosperous. He would have children that hit the womb would be blessed. There would be fruitfulness that would come from him. And we know that out of Yosef, the two sons that he had both became great nations. We know that, or I shouldn't say great nations because they're part of the nation of Israel, but we know great progeny. We know that lots of little ones, okay, down the line. Um, verse 26, I think, is where we need to pick up in word for word. So it says, the blessings of your father have surpassed the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. Okay, the blessings of your father, Jacob himself, because remember he's speaking to Yosef, so he's saying to Yosef, the blessings of your father, the blessings of mine, that that's even been surpassed, that my ancestors, their blessings were so great, Avraham and Yitzhak, so he's saying as, as great as my blessings were, I look back and I see the great blessings to, to Isaac, the great blessings especially to Avraham, that these would continue on, these will endure. Um, it, that it, it will go to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. That's a, a way, and you may have slightly different words in your version, but the idea is limits. It's just that the limits would be the mountaintops, they would be the valleys, they would be spreading out the everlasting hills, age enduring mountains. It makes me think of the Psalm to Halim, Psalm 121, uh, that, that I, I, okay, <laughs> start it right, Rochelle. I'm in the middle of it. I can't get to the start. You look into the hills from whence comes your help. My help cometh from the maker, the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I will look into the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the, from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I really did a lousy job. Look up to Helene, Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. I know it well. I just can't get it out in my right words. But the idea is that we look at those mountains. How long have they been there? What have they endured? We know that, that that's been thousands of years. That's been millennia, we could say easily. And yet, what does it show us? It shows us power and strength and majesticness. And when I think that my God created those mountains, he called it into existence. He created the valleys and all that's in between. It speaks to the power. It speaks to, to the, the width. Because we know that the love of God is boundless. And this is what I believe Yaakov is saying to him, that your God who created these mountains, your God who has blessed your ancestry so greatly, those blessings are going to endure for you. They're going to go on even as the mountains have gone on. They're going to be peaks even as the mountains are peaks, etc., etc., etc. One said it was to the very boundaries marked by the surrounding ancient hills. Okay? As far as you could see, I'll put it that way, from the mountaintops over to the plains and keep on going that that's how far you're going to be blessed and we see that in even in the sense today out of the jewish nation the jewish people have been scattered to the, throughout the world as we've said before you can't go to a country and not find a jew there because they've been scattered everywhere and then when you look at the studies that are given and this is not meant to be proud or, or arrogant that's not the point of it but god has blessed the jew He's given them a good mind so that they're in the head of uh, technology. They're in the head of sciences. They're in the head of so many areas. I don't think there's an area that touches our lives that there haven't been Jewish people at the top that are, are being able to determine and learn and, and figure. The, the peace prizes that have been given to these workers, I'm, again, I should have done my homework and had my statistics here and be able to talk more intelligently, but I think you know what I'm saying. I see that even as part of this blessing, that God is blessing them and they've gone throughout the earth, taking those blessings to their people around them and to the world at large, because even we here in America are blessed by things that have been created in other locations. We know that, you know, and I could give you many examples, but not the point of Bereshit here, so I'll go on and I'll let your mind just 
take that word Google if you want. Google Jewish inventors for one thing. Find out how many of those inventions touch your life that you never had any idea. Everything from the big pen to the polio vaccine to, um, oh, it's endless, yes. They also invented uh, a biochip for your phones and Oh, the whole cell phone, everything, yes. Jewish that owns the big business and he, he wanted to protect his family. I'd be telling everybody to check out the vibe chip because it, it was sort of lost the radiation. Okay, that's a newer stuff even, yeah, so yes. Newer, but yeah, your cell phones, all of that. Prizes. Yes, uh, the Nobel Prizes. Prize. Yes. When I said peace, that's what I meant. A disproportionate yes. number of them compared to others. Yeah. Right, right. The number of Jews in this world and then compared to the number of prizes won by Jews, and it is greatly disproportionate. And again, not meant in, in a, a way of arrogance at all. It's God's faithfulness. It's God yeah, giving blessed them. them. He's blessed them. Yeah. And he's blessed them to be a blessing. Remember, that's what he said with Abraham, that, that he would bless those who bless him. And it was to be a blessing to them. So yes, yes, we see it go on and on. But again, sticking to our, our main here, not getting off on our tangents too far, we're looking at the next phrase, and on the crown of the head of the one distinguished among his brothers, on the head, it would be like a crown upon Yosef. And really, we see that almost literally by being second only to Pharaoh. But he was distinguished. He was um, separated. He was consecrated for higher duties. He had to have been amazed when he looked back at his life and remembered the time of slavery and the time in the pit to come up into such a high position. Who else does that? You don't move from slavery and from prison into the throne room. That's only by the hand of God who was at work. And it's interesting that this, this word that he would be distinguished that in that the same Hebrew word, it comes from the same root, is the word Nazarite. That there would be a Nazarite who would be distinguished, who would wear a crown. Who is that a picture of? Jesus. Jesus. Yeshua Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. That uh, um, we will see in complete glory wearing his the crowns upon his head. Um, but he'd be distinguished among his brothers apart from his brothers. He would be the leader of his brothers, and we definitely see that even in his position now. He has rescued his brothers, and he's keeping them alive. So even in that, we see it marked out for that special distinction, for that special service, and it would continue on. Yahshua, the leader that leads the children of Israel into the Promised Land, follows in the, um, well, Moshe was the leader that brought him up, and then Joshua that, that Joshua that carried them into the promised land. That numbers, uh, Bedman Bar numbers 13 and verse 8. Joshua is of Joseph's seed. Comes through Ephraim. So just an interesting side note. Let me say though, fulfilled in history is through Ephraim, through Manasseh, through um, Ephraim and Manasseh. That you have Joshua, Deborah, Samuel, Shmuel. You have Gideon and Jephthah. Um, both tribes were strong in war. Their lands were fertile and productive. Jeroboam came from Ephraim. He, he led the rebellion that produced the divided kingdom. And the northern kingdom became synonymously known as Israel and Ephraim in time. So you can see the, the, how, how much the name carried on. To have the family name be what that area becomes distinguished over, that was because they were so predominant and they were in leadership positions. Uh, even as we carry our names down today, um, just to give you a, a quick example, oftentimes the names, at, at least in our Jewish families, were dependent on either their uh, livelihood, like a tailor was a tailor, <laughs> uh, but a name, um, for instance, and I have no proof of it, we don't even know who it would be, but we've been told the name Pearl probably had a female distinguished leader who had that name that gave that family that identification. Again, we have no proof of that. We've never found that. We have a little family history. We don't have a lot because of persecution and so forth. But the name carrying, when you, when you see a town named after somebody, they carry the, uh, the leadership and they got recognized for it. That's what we're seeing. The recognition carried on down long past Yosef. Um, now, 
Yaakov, Jacob's blessings, centered especially on Yosef and Judah, the two sons. We see, you know, especially the blessings that are going for these two. And these two, again, are the two that we see, the, the northern and the southern, the southern being Judah and the northern being Ephraim from Joseph. We see those two kingdoms distinguished in that way. What's interesting is that when you look at the line with Judah, you'll look at the spiritual promises. And when you look at the line with Ephraim and Yahshua, you'll look at the earthly promises. God's promise to bless them with the earth, bless them with the spiritual blessings from above. And we see that come through this line and then especially, of course, with Messiah coming from Judah, the, the greater the spiritual blessing that is there. That also will be, uh, how do I put it? In the physical, what I mean is Messiah will also literally physically rule on this earth in the millennial kingdom. So heaven will meet earth. Thy, thy will be done as it is in heaven, so it will be on earth. Political, everything will be under Messiah. Can hardly wait. So this prophecy in particular with Yosef, starting from his early, early days in his father's home, goes all the way through a prophetic view into millennial reign of Messiah and Savior who would come through Judah, our Messiah, Yeshua Jesus. So um, <coughs> amazing the, the scope, <coughs> excuse me, the scope of prophecy that we see. How could you foretell, try to foretell a day next week and say this will happen from morning to night. Try to do that for a month from now. Try to do it for a year from now. Try to do it for three, four, five, six, seven generations from now. You'd fail miserably. They will laugh at you. We were told that by this time in the 2020s, we'd have hoverboards. We wouldn't have traffic anymore. We'd be beaming up and all over and come down and boom. Hey, I'm still waiting for that. Every time I sit in traffic, I think about that. <laughs> Man makes ideas, I you know, man, man, oh, yeah, I, I heard it in my teen years, I heard it, early teen years, that, that by this point we'd be living with that, um, but man makes plans, God laughs, his role is there, but to be able to tell prophetically, if I had nothing else in scripture, but the prophecies, and seeing how they were fulfilled the first time with Yeshua, and, and what will come the second time, if I had nothing else, that's enough to make me believe this book was not written by man. This book is a mastermind. This book is a master craftsmanship. This book is alive. And when you see it in its living color, where it meant something in 2000 BC, and it means something in 2024 AD, it, just, it can just blow your mind. But that's our God. That's our God, and that's his word, and that's why we're here studying it. Hallelujah. What a mind. Who else could have put in the prophecy from Yaakov all that Yosef's life would cover? And again, it's one of these times where I've just hit the highlights. I know I haven't even done it justice. But I'll move on to little brother Benjamin. <laughs> Benjamin. Verse 27. Um, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. Benjamin was strong and bold. What does it say that he is ravenous, that he devours, he consumes, or in the Hebrew, he shall raven, he shall tear it into shreds. It speaks of a mighty warrior, fierce, cruel, and that's who the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin was. They were violent in spirit. Let me just give you a few examples. Let's look real quickly at Judges chapter 20. Judges chapter 20, and we'll look at verses 15 to 17. Taking care of his little brother. You want him to be a sweet little innocent brother, but well, not innocent, but not vicious. <laughs> but he, they, they were, they did some pretty vicious things. <laughs> read the scriptures I put down for you. We're not going to read them all, but uh, verse 15: From the cities on the day the sons of Benjamin were numbered, twenty-six thousand men who drew the sword, besides the inhabitants of Gibeah who were numbered seven hundred. Out of all these 700 choice men were left-handed. Each one could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. 
Then the men of Israel besides Benjamin were numbered 400,000 men who draw the sword. All of these were men of war. So the tribe of Benjamin, if you needed to go to war, you wanted his tribe to come help you. You wanted him to uh, back you up and to be there with you because as it says in, in back in Genesis that he would be ravenous as a wolf. The wolf is on the prowl. The wolf is, is um, swift and ferocity, you know, the damage that is done. And he could be against his own brothers. I'll, I'll take you back if you didn't get go away. Um, look again at Judges 20, verses 20 and 21. The men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. And the men of Israel raid for the battle against them. Then the sons, okay, tells you how many came out. I thought it told you what they did, but they, even when they fought their brothers, they they were fierce against even their own brothers. The scriptures that I've given, I, I we've looked at Judges 20, 15 to 17, and 20 and 21. Look at 2 Samuel, 2 Shmuel 2, verses 15 and 16. Chronicles tells us, 1 Chronicles 12, 2. And 2 Chronicles 17, 17, it shows that they were the fiercest and the most warlike out of all the tribes. You'll see that in Judges 3, 15 to 30. Moab, Moab subdued um, under Ehud. Ehud was a Benjamite. Okay, so Ehud, um, second judge, I think of the judges in that time, it tells there, it, uh, or that may be in 1 Samuel where it tells it in chapter 9. Um, now, I think 1 Samuel chapter 9 gets us into King Sha'ol, King Saul, who comes from the tribe of Benjamin. But my point is that look at, look at his hatred against David, against David. You know, here David had done so much for him, and he hunted him down to kill him. You know, they just had an ability to be fierce and to be cruel. And if I take it to Saul of Tarsus, Sha'ol that becomes Paul, that becomes our, our apostle, our leader, who teaches us the ways that we should walk in according to um, following our Savior, Yeshua Jesus. In his before time, before he knew the Lord personally, he went after the Christians with a vendetta. He didn't care if you were male or female. He wanted you either imprisoned or killed, and he was intent. It's even believed that it was he who brought the charges up against Stephen, the first martyr. He, he was a Benjamite, yes, came from the tribe of Benjamin. So they just were notorious for that ability to, to really come against brothers or enemies and to be fierce and to be cruel. I'm sure in your own life we all know people who have more of a hard side to them, and I, I believe that's you know what it's telling us about. Because back in Genesis it says that it was constant. That's our next phrase when we're back in chapter 49 and verse... Um, 27 it says in the morning he devours the prey and in the evening he divides the spoil so the idea is morning and evening is incessant the victories are continuous he's capturing his booty but he's still going to war he's still going to war he's still going to war and he's so successful that at night he's dividing all the goodies that he's gotten so it, it just shows it was a constant he that was his mindset was warlike fierce and he could be cruel when he felt he needed to be now here also tells us why we know this word of God is inspired. You heard Loretta a moment ago. I can't believe this, a little brother Benjamin, and he, who he comes from, knowing he was Rachel and Joseph's second son. You know, she doesn't want to picture him in this way. Can you imagine a father giving a prophetic uh, last words over his son, these are his words, when this is his son that came from his favored wife. He wouldn't have chosen. He would have chosen it. Benjamin, uh, you know, that all blessings should follow you. And, and, you know, it would have been oozing that special love because he was Rachel's seed. Well, look at uh, Joseph. You know, he was favored. Why he couldn't have gotten allowed Benjamin, that's his little brother, uh, it wasn't that God could not allow. It's that God does born us with different personalities, and he uses our personalities. We can use them for good. We can use them for evil. But God works in the hearts of each. And I'm not telling you that Benjamin didn't have a heart for God. 
He's one of the 12 tribes. He followed God also. But I'm telling you that, that there was this other side. And there had to be those who would be warriors. There had to be those who would be fighters. I will guarantee you, if you're going to war, you don't want an army of Rochelles. Okay? <laughs> you really don't. Army. I'm not going to have the stomach for it. I'm not going to be able to take out my enemy. Same. Now, if you're going to hurt somebody I love, you might see my anger come up you know, yeah. for a moment. But, you know, God has to use, oh, he doesn't have to do anything, but you know what I mean. God does use the differences. But my point being, this wouldn't be your last recorded words if you were just speaking from yourself. But the fact that Yaakov was not speaking his own words, he was speaking what God told him to say. What was being recorded was what God was saying. It just shows the inspiration and the fact that it carries out truth. You know, just because Benjamin was a little fighter doesn't mean that his son and son's son and so on and so forth were going to be. And that the whole tribe would be known for being the, the fierce warriors. Again, like I said, if they were going to war, they wanted the tribe of Benjamin with them. You know, come on up. We need fighters, you know, so. It just added that Jacob shouted with love. Where's the love there? It's like Black Cedar Point. Yeah, and I understand what you're saying, you know, yeah. but uh, but yes, I, I've often thought too, in all honesty, I'm glad that I'm not being written about in the Word of God for generations to read because I don't know if the dirty laundry would be hung out or the good, <laughs> and I'm glad to stay behind the scenes. But God brings out for purpose, and that's what we're seeing, His, his infinite um, foreknowledge that, that knew and said and it happened. So verse 28, we've come to the end to get, that was our last, our twelfth son. Verse 28, all these are the twelve tribes of Israel and this is what their father said to them when he blessed them. He blessed them everyone with a blessing appropriate to him. Okay, here they're being prophetically called the 12 tribes of Israel because they're just developing into that. Remember, they're sons with families right now. They're not what, you know, we're looking back and calling them the tribes. And as we get on down the line, when they go into the promised land, they are tribes and they're being divided accordingly. But here, Yaakov is giving us the very start. We've got the head of each tribe by name. And they're each given the blessing that was appropriate to them, even like Reuben and Simeon, Shimon, and you know, who it wasn't all good that was said of them. Still, they got the appropriate blessing. They received a share in the blessing. They received a portion of land in the promised land. So it wasn't that, that they had to be perfect to receive blessing. But God did call it what it is. He did bring it out. Again, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it is obvious that God's hand was on each one regardless because not one, not one tribe perished even when they spent four centuries, 400 years in Egypt. All the 12 tribes came out. And I will tell you that when they went into captivity in Assyria and in Babylon, all the 12 tribes came out. I will tell you that there are no 10 lost tribes. That's a bee in my bonnet, so I'm on my little sandbox, but there are no lost tribes. Yaakov James, in the, our book, in our Brita Hadashah, our New Covenant, wrote to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. They were in the diaspora. They were scattered. 70 AD, the, the temple being destroyed, Jerusalem being denuded by uh, Titus and the Roman army. The Jewish people have been dispersed ever since. They've never all been back home. First fruits, 1948. And those that God has brought back home in the hearts that he's drawing even now. But it's never been that they've all come back. But God's faithfulness, he knows where every single tribe is. He knows and he never lost them. They never were lost. They were captive, but they remained a people. And that's a miracle also. Even for the nation of Israel, out of their land almost 2,000 years, no other people group remained a people group when they were out of their land. Even the Philistines that the name Palestine comes off of and that, that misnomer from 135 AD by Roman Herodian, um, Hadrian, sorry, Hadrian, that was in charge at that time and made the slur on Israel. Even the actual people, the Philistines, there's no Philistines today. 
They assimilated. They became like the people that they were around. They took on their ways and they just disappear on the pages of history. And the history books will tell you that. So the people today who say they're Palestinian coming from Philistine, they're coming from a people who historically, it is said, they disappeared because they're not of those people. They're of Arab descent and they belong to the other Arab countries around. Yes, there are many that have been there and their, their generations have been in the land of Israel, but it wasn't their land. God said, it's my land and I give it to who I give it to. I put my name on it and we know who he gave it to. But uh, again, I know I'm on my soapbox and forgive me for it, but I hear it today so often. Oh, you know, we're, we're reaching out. We found a lost tribe and they're in Ethiopia or they're here or they're there. Are there Jewish people in Ethiopia? Absolutely. Absolutely. Have they been brought home? A good majority of them? Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Miraculously so. But they're not a tribe. The tribe are these 12 here. They're part of one of these sons or more than one of these sons. I can't follow the lines, but I can tell you who can. And that's my God. And you want the proof? Go with me to Revelation 7. Go with me to Revelation 14. You will see 12 tribes named. And when God says, I'm going to bring 144,000 out of the tribe of Shur, I guarantee you those 12,000 are not Naphtali's kids. And they're not Yosef's kids. They are Asher's kids. Asher. Okay? I guarantee you that. And if God says, I can do that with every single tribe, 12,000, they're going to be mine. I'm going to bring them up. They're going to be my evangelists. I'm going to seal them so that Satan can't touch them. They're going to go out to the ends of the earth with the gospel message. <laughs> Praise the Lord. What a plan. And here's the beginning. It's going to be 12,000 that are Naphtali's kids and Benjamin's kids and Joseph's kids. And I can go through all the names. That's my God. That's amazing. Because through all the lines, the assimilating, the marrying, the mixed marriages, those who don't even know they're Jewish. And yet God knows. And God's the one keeping the records. And God's going to bring them out. Will he let them know what tribe they're from? I don't know. I don't know. I'll ask that up in heaven. Are they going to know? I do know DNA has found the marker for the Levitical tribe. For those who are Cohen's and Levy's, there's a certain chromosome that marks their DNA. Interesting. Maybe there's other markers for each of the sons. Maybe they will find that out. I will tell you DNA has gone so far is to prove the Bible right. And I love this, and then I'll get off my soapbox, but I love this. DNA tells every Jewish person that you come from one of four mamas. And when I heard that, I got the biggest smile, ear to ear smile, and said, you know what they just did? They just proved my Bible true. Because you know who my Bible says the Jewish nation came from? Jacob and his wife Leah, number one, and his wife Rachel, number two, and Rachel's handmaid Bilhah, number three, and Leah's handmaid Zilpha, number four. Guess what? Every Jewish person came from one of four mamas. <laughs> and DNA, and I think it was 2022, came out with that statement. I could not, have, I, I was a Cheshire cat. All, all the world can do is prove the word of God. The same way as in archaeology. Turn a spade and turn a page. Give archaeology enough time, they will uncover everything that the Bible has said to prove it true. I love it. My God is awesome. Yeah, someone, someone, uh, there's a part of our DNA that like, literally they look like a, a cross. cross. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Marked in our DNA. And, and then if you haven't seen, go watch Lula.